Come on, lift up a shout unto God. Let your, re- let your praise be released like a mighty river. John 7, 38. Out of your belly, out of your belly shall flow rivers. River, not a trickle. Rivers, not a drop. Rivers, rivers, rivers of living water. Just let it flow out of there. Just open up your mouth. Put your hands together. Jump up and down a little bit. Wave your hands before the Lord. Let this earth know you're alive unto God. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let the devil know that you know no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. God is with you. Who can be against you? Hallelujah. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Well, David said I was glad, happy, ecstatic. I got enthused. I got excited. I started feeling better. The darkness dissipated. The lightness dawned when I woke up on Sunday morning. And they said unto me, come on, come on, come on. Let us go into the house of the Lord. Moses said, this is the house of God. It is the very gateway into heaven. You are in no ordinary place this morning. You are in the very tabernacle of the almighty God. He's here to meet your need, heal your body. Deliver your family. Set at liberty your mind from every bondage. Hallelujah to the risen Lamb of God. Shout his praises, all ye people. Give thanks unto God, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Shout forever. Well, glory. Oh, I'm glad to be here this morning. Glad I found my way to the church. Aren't you glad? I said, aren't you glad? There's hope in the name of the Lord. There's peace in the name of the Lord. There's victory in the name of the Lord. There's security in the name of the Lord. There's heaven in the name of the Lord. There's victory, victory, victory in the name of the Lord. And his name is, his name is, Counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace, everlasting Father, I am that I am, more than enough, 
El Shaddai, the God who creates before there's a need. Blessed be his name forever. Well, I'm just in love with him this morning. And because I'm in love with him, it makes me in love with you. And that's a miracle. Some of you are pretty unlovely. That's all right, we love you anyway. Some of you never been in a service like this. Let me just encourage you. It'll get worse. And what's worse about it? Before you know it, you'll be enjoying it. Now, I know it goes contradictory to everything you've been told about church, but we have fun here. We don't believe God's sitting on his throne ready to throw lightning bolts at us. We believe he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish but have everlasting life. We found that life. He said he'd give us joy unspeakable and full of glory. And we found that joy. He said he'd give us peace that passes understanding. And we found that peace. He said he would redeem us from the snare of the fowler. And he would make our feet like hinds feet. And keep us from falling in a world that's falling apart. And we're glad for that. We're glad for it this morning. We're glad for a cross that bleeds. A savior that redeems. A king that is coming again. We're glad to know we're on our way to heaven today. And there's nothing the devil can do about it. But we're glad to be in church. I mean, we're glad. You wonder why everybody yells out when I say that. Well, they're just giving their affirmation that what I'm saying is true because it wouldn't make any difference to you who are standing by if I was the only one excited about being here. Are you listening to me? But how many other folks were glad this morning when eyes popped open you said, hey, it's the Lord's day. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will, I will, yeah, I will rejoice and be glad yeah. in it. When I think of his goodness and what he's done for me, when I think of his goodness, how he set me free, I can dance, 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 dance. Whoa, all night, all night, all night, yeah. all night. Well, when I think of his goodness and what he's done for me, when I think of his goodness, well, I could dance, 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 dance all night, all night, all night, yeah, all night. Well, when I think of His goodness, what He's done for me, when I think of His goodness, well, I could spin, 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 spin all night, all night, all night, all night. Well, when I think of His goodness, what He's done for me, when I think of His goodness. Well, I can leap, 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 all night, all night, all night, Well, when I think of his goodness, what he's done for me, when I think of his goodness, well, I could wait, 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 Has he been good to you? I mean, has he been better than good to you? Has he been real, real good to you? Hallelujah! Well, we're going to sing a little bit more of that. All over this great complex, when I was coming into the building, there were two or three hundred children out here, just one class. A couple hundred of them out there going from one area of the building to another area of the building to be ministered to have their praise and worship and be taught on their level. And if you're here and you're unsure about how to get your children involved in that ministry, just find anybody with a badge, just anybody with a badge. And whether they're a network leader or they're an usher or whatever capacity they're in, they can help you find what you need. And there's ministry available to every area of your family this morning, every age group, every facet of your family we're ready to meet them at the point of their need and take good care of them in the love of jesus christ of Nazareth. we're glad you're here 
We're going to sing just one more song as you head back to your seat. Greet 25 people that you don't know. Tell them you're glad they're here in the house of the Lord on the Lord's day. With all of my heart, with all of my heart, I'm going to praise you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord, with all of my heart. Yeah, with all of my heart, with all of my heart, I will praise you, Lord, with all of my heart. With all of my heart, all of my heart, all of my heart, I'm going to praise you, I'm going to praise you, I'm going to praise you, Lord, with all of my heart. Praise the Lord, you may be seated. So glad, so glad, so glad, so glad, so glad, so glad to have you here today around the Word of God. I believe you're going to be changed today. I said, I believe you're going to be changed today. Hallelujah. Don't want you to forget about the other services. I know some of you that are here on Sunday morning think this is the only time we get together. But that's not the case. We get together tonight, 7 o'clock, for a great evangelistic service. I've got some things rolling around in my spirit about the Holy Ghost that I may just dump on you tonight. Ready or not, here it comes. And I don't want you to miss that Sunday night service. I understand we're heading back into the school year. My little girl starts school this year. Isn't that wonderful? I, don't, I know I don't look old enough to have a little girl in school, but uh, she's only in the three-year-old preschool, so please understand that. She's not, she's not entering university yet. But I understand that, and as a parent, I understand that it's important for you to get your children the proper rest and I would hate to think that you would leave your children home from church because they need to get up the next morning from, for school. Some folks want excuses as good as another. Stop to see one fellow and he said, I said, why weren't you in church on Sunday? He said, well, my neighbor borrowed my lawnmower two weeks ago. I said, what's that have to do with being in church? He said, nothing, but I figured one excuse was as good as another. So don't make an excuse. We get you out in plenty of time and what your children will receive in the house of God is more important than what they receive in the school classroom anyway. And they get them five days a week and if we're very fortunate and if you obey God, then we only get them three times a week. So get them in here. We'll get them home in plenty of time for you to get them up and get them in school. Then on Wednesday night, we meet at seven o'clock. Now, how anybody survives a week all the way from Sunday to Sunday is an enigma to me. I just can't comprehend how you can make it and not share fellowship with the saints, not get a fresh word off the altar of God, not come in with thousands of other like-minded and like-spirited believers to throw your hands up in the air and get in the presence of God and get encouraged and get everything the world put on you that week taken off. Are you listening to me? Oh, you need that Wednesday night service to get stirred up in your spirit, give you strength to go on in the week. And uh, Lord willing, this week I'll be diving back into the renamed and redeemed syllabus on Wednesday night. So if you have yours, bring it with you. And we'll have a great time on Wednesday night. Amen? Amen. How many of you were able to see Friday night uh, Trinity Broadcasting's Praise the Lord program? How many of you did see that? Just, just a few of you. We had a tremendous time. The Spirit of God just, I mean, on a Friday night, they're not used to doing much. On Friday night, they're just used to giving a testimony or two and maybe, maybe somebody would call in. 
We literally burned the phone lines up with preachers calling in repenting, preachers calling in getting back in the ministry, preachers calling in getting restored to God. There's a revival in America and we're glad to be a part of it. The power of God was manifest in a wonderful way. And while I was there, I just decided to talk about my latest book. It's called Repairs of the Breach. I know most of you have never seen it. If you have seen it, two thirds of you have never read it. And I'll make you tell on yourself right now. How many of you have never read this book cover to cover? Raise your hand. You see, why do I pour my life out? Now I tried to be good today. I tried to be nice. I tried to be nice. How many of you have never read it? Cover it. You've never read it through. Well, don't you believe in my ministry? Don't you believe in what I have to say? How many of you don't even own one of these books? Three fourths of you. Get my books, somebody. Go get them. Get boxes of them. Bring them in here right now. Isn't that pitiful? Isn't that pitiful that I would spend a year of my life pouring my life into a book and the people in my own church don't even read it? I think that's pitiful. Hello. Everybody say, shame on me. And that's what I say too. See, you don't know things like this. You don't know this. So I'll read it to you. Are you ready? I mean, this isn't, this isn't something I just did in my spare time. Hello? I want to leave something in your heart. Nearly half of this book I've never preached in public. Nearly half of it. And besides that, the other half that I have preached in public that's now in print form, you've forgotten two-thirds of that. You've already forgotten it. So I'm just encouraging you. I'm, ju I'm just encouraging you. I mean, if we're blessing America and we're blessing the world, this book's already into its third printing. Third printing, it's been out less than a month. And yet 90% of the people that sit in this church three services a week don't even own one. Hello, you got Benny's book back there. I can't have church for you reading Benny's book while I'm trying to preach. Well, I love Benny, but he needs a new hairstyle and he shouldn't, he shouldn't. He's my friend, leave me alone. But it's the same always. A prophet is not without honor except in his own country. Are you listening to me? I walked in Benny Hinn's church. They had the largest crowd they've had for years. The night I was gonna preach, people standing around outside trying to get in. And people sitting around in his congregation reading my book. Now, now let me ask you this question. What is wrong with this picture? Huh? Are you with me? And besides, that's the only way you can, I mean, you might do it like this and get Benny to blow on you out of it, but he ain't gonna blow on you out of that book. I'm telling you right now. Some of you need blown on, I can tell. You need it. Bad. Look at somebody next to you and say, you need it. But say, Benny's not the only one with the anointing. Now just turn around there and blow on him. Go ahead. There you go. I don't care if he makes mud pies and throws it on people. If they get healed, I don't care. I think it's wonderful. But now then we're talking about my book. Four hundred and thirteen pages of my heart to you. And there are things in there that you don't know. Let me just ask you a question. I'll ask this side of the choir. How many, how many, this is not a trick question. How many one dollar bills are there to every one hundred dollar bill that's currently in circulation in the United States? Have any idea? How many $1 bills to every $100 bill? What would you say? See, you don't know because none of you read my book. I ought to make you go sit out there today. <laughs> well, you would naturally think 
that there were hundreds, maybe even thousands more $1 bills in circulation than there are $100 bills, wouldn't you? You know why you think that way? Because you only get in contact with the $1 bills. $1 bills, they sit around in the bank vault with $100 bills and a $100 bill goes to bragging about all the places it's been. They talk to the $1 bill and he says, well, I went to church and 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 I went to church some more and I've been to church. See, you don't even believe. You're not even gonna believe what I'm gonna tell you, but it's in the book. There are 60 $100 bills to every $1 bill in circulation in the United States of America right now at this moment. 60 times more $100 bills than there are $1 bills. Now, you know what that says? Somebody's on the wrong end of the stick. There's plenty of money, it's just in the wrong hands. Are you listening to me? Think about that. Well, I'm ready to read to you. Are you ready to listen? You can follow along if you had a book, but since you don't, I'll read to you. When you get over to page 299, if you haven't fallen asleep yet by then, the chapter opens by asking the question, did God goof? Did God make a mistake? Did he put too many people on too small a planet and leave too little resources to take care of them all? Hardly. In the next 20 years, everybody say 20 years. 20 years. How many of you are more than 20 years old? How fast did the last 20 go? <laughs> Went fast, didn't it? In the next 20 years, the world will mine $50 trillion in gold, $300 billion in silver, $600 billion in iron, tin, zinc, and lead. This is new wealth. Everybody say, new wealth. Now what I'm talking about in this chapter in Repairs of the Breach is getting the foundation of financial freedom and scriptural biblical prosperity back in the theology of the church. The Bible says the kingdom of the children of darkness are wiser than the children of light concerning money, and they are. You ask investment bankers how many dollar bills there are in comparison to hundred dollar bills, I'll guarantee you they can tell you. You know why? Because they deal in the hundreds all day long. You're just staring at me now. I know what you're wishing. You're wishing you had a book, but you don't. <laughs> this is new wealth. Everybody say new wealth. new wealth. In other words, all that stuff is not even mine yet. It's gonna be mined and put in the economic system of this planet in the next 20 years. Think of it. Listen to this. This new wealth, not currently in our economic system, just from eight key minerals is over $52 trillion worth of new wealth which will be created in the next 20 years. Well, I don't know about you, I'm gonna get me some of it. Look at you, you're so steeped in religious tradition, you're afraid to, afraid to even shout amen. amen. I mean, I'm not talking about taking anything from anybody. This is new stuff. Amen. I'd like to have some of it. Amen. I mean, I'm 50, 50 trillion dollars in gold alone will be mined in the next 20 years. Well, I'd just like to have a chunk of it, just about that big. Amen. Hello? I could buy a hundred secular television stations every week to preach the gospel that you hear in this house. I could do that. But I can't do it because all you know about is $1 bills. That's the reason I wrote this book. If I could get you to read it, it might change you. In a world of supposedly scant resources, 
There are over 14 tons of explosives already created for every man, woman, boy, and girl on this planet. Did you hear that? And we talk about that we don't have enough. 14 tons of just explosive material for every man, woman, boy, and girl on this globe right now at this moment. Coal reserves. Now that's reserves. You know what reserves is? That means it's already been mined, it's stockpiled, it's just sitting there. This is what we should have told the Democratic Carter, Con Carter administration, hello, while we were having an energy crisis. Standing in gas lines 14 miles long with interest rates 21.5%. I just thought I'd throw that in. You wanna go back, you wanna go back, you wanna go back, you wanna go back to 12 years ago, help yourself. Well, anyway, that's just, that's just my opinion and I know I'm not supposed to have it. I, I didn't put that in the book. <laughs> Coal reserves, reserves. Right now at this moment, $383 trillion. That don't do anything for anybody but me. You all just sat and stared at me. Did you hear what I said? That's the stuff piled up, we ain't even using. But we're told all the time, we're barely, we, oh, oh, the, the, green th the green thumbs, more like green heads, <laughs> cabbage heads I call them. I mean, I'm all for saving owls, but I'm also for saving people's jobs. And I'm also for saving babies in the wombs of their mothers. And for that too. Do you know right now that college entrance is at the lowest of any time in the history of this nation? Do you know that? Do you know why? Because we killed all the babies that would have been college age now. That's why they're not here. But anyway, that's not in the book either. See, I ought to keep writing. No, because you wouldn't read it anyway. Coal reserves are estimated $383 trillion. There is so much money printed in the United States of America that at this moment, $134 billion is unaccounted for. Nobody even knows where it is. We printed $134 billion, we lost. We don't, whoops. Is that amazing? Is that amazing? And yet you're told and you're led to believe and the devil wants to dupe you into thinking that it's gonna bankrupt heaven for you to be able to pay your mortgage off and get out of debt so that you can help finance the end time revival of God. You better read. Well, this wasn't my sermon for today, but it's developing that way. Think of that. Get that missionary barrel mentality out of your brain. It's a lie. Don't listen to those perpetrating it either. I can't come on, I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed to make political statements. Maybe if I came down here and you and I were just talking, we just talking. They're not walking out on me, they're just coming out here to listen. I make them sit up there Bless their hearts. Well, anyway. Yeah, I can say off the record. My, mom, my mama said I could. I could. I could talk off the record. I don't want to make, I just don't want to make you mad. I, something about International House of Pancakes just keeps shooting through my brain. 
This world, this world, that's the problem with America. That's the problem with our society. And we don't even recognize it when people get up in national conventions and pipe it out. This introspection, well, what about us? Well, what about us? Well, let the world go to hell. Why do we care? I'm sorry, but the world is a smaller place than it was 12 years ago. I'm sorry to say that. I'm sorry to say that there are powder kegs brewing all over this world. Oh, I've traveled it, I've seen it, I know it. The Soviet Union, the former Soviet states, Russia itself is more to be feared right now by the American population than at any time during the Cold War. And America better wake up. We need somebody that's not just a former presidential prototype with his pretty hair and zappy personality. We need somebody that knows how to sit down with world leaders and let them know that when you negotiate with this planet and when you negotiate with the Saddam Husseins of this globe, you don't do it from a stature of weakness, you do it from a stature of strength. Yeah, we need some changes in America. We need some. We need a lot. We need prayer returned to the public schools. We need that. We need to appoint another Supreme Court justice that will once and for all rid this nation of the scourge of Roe versus Wade. That's what we need. trying to read to you from my book. I just, all I'm asking you to do is think. Just think. Don't be caught up in this thing of how bad off you are. We always want to blame the president of the United States that people are out of work. A whole lot of people out of work didn't bother to go look for a job. That's a whole lot of them that want to do, that want to do in this nation what people want to do in the church, and that is have somebody else do everything for them. Don't you blame it on poverty. Don't you blame murder on poverty. There are some of us who were so poor we couldn't pay attention, and we didn't go out and murder people. Are you listening to me? Don't you blame it on that. That's a lie. That's the devil's way out. president doesn't live in your neighborhood, but you do, and you can make a difference. Gather up that bunch and bring them to church. That's a good place to start. Put them in your car that you rode in here this morning with only two people in, and God bless you with that big old car. You could get eight people in, but you just brought your two. And then you want to point to the Congress or point to the president and blame them. Hello. Well, I'm not supposed to be political. $134 billion in the United States currently is currently, a currency is currently unaccounted for. 60 times more $100 bills are in circulation than $1 bills. There is one millionaire for every 100 households in this nation. It's in the book. A millionaire for every 100 households. Now, if we singled out 100 households, I just went out there and picked out 100 households. And then I picked out another 100 households, and then I picked out another 100 households, and then I picked out another 100 households of the thousands of households that are represented here this morning. How many millionaires do you think I'd find? Not very many. But there's one for every 100 households in America, but they're not going to church. The money's all in the wrong hands. Is anybody in this building? You're all gone home. 
Friend, there is an abundance of wealth in the world and it is yours for the taking for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says over in the book of Proverbs that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Did you hear what I said? But the devil has blinded the eyes of Christians and attempted to give them a poverty mentality. He gets you to focus on the famine in Ethiopia and other parts of Africa where people are starving. They are starving, but not because God did not provide more than enough. I'm gonna say it again. You cannot bless what God has cursed. I, I can't help dare it. Go in there in my briefcase. Open up my briefcase. In the front pouch, there is a three-quarter sheet of tight paper. It's got some stuff. I'm making some notes. Just bring it in here. I know you don't think this is important, but I do. But I do. Some of you are mad at me now. I can't help it. I can't help it. I can't help it. All I'm asking you to do is think. Just think. That's all I'm asking you to do. Now just hush and stay with the book. There are people starving in Africa, but not because God did not provide more than enough. I started off the chapter asking you, go back and look at, did God goof? Did God make a mistake? Is that the reason people are starving in Ethiopia? Because God messed up? Is that the reason you can't pay your bills? Because God messed up? Is that the reason you can't put your child in Christian education? Because God made a mistake when it came to you? How many of you will agree with me? There's something wrong. And I don't want you to focus just on, well, God wants you to prosper because you need a new suit or you need a new home. I'm talking about we need a revival in America. We need a revival in the world. The earth is producing more than enough food. It is man who is failing in his responsibility to distribute that food properly. You cannot bless what God has cursed because of disobedience to his truth, his word, and the rejection of his son, and the exaltation of idolatry on this planet. I know everybody wants to take credit for winning the Cold War. I know that. I want you to know who won the Cold War. His name is Jehovah. And he didn't win it with tanks either. I'll tell you how he won it. He shut the rain off. You want to know why the Soviet Union bowed its knee? Huh? It wasn't because of American aggression. The Soviet Union bowed its knee and the communist devil is dead for one reason. God starved him to death. He shut off the rain. That's it. You're, good. you're a good man. Everybody say, Darren, you're a good man. I probably got 500 pages of notes in that briefcase and he brought just the right one. You cannot bless what God has cursed. And you cannot be blessed operating under a curse. Is anybody listening to me today? You know, church is more than just hoopla and wham, bam, and fall on the floor. And there's more to it than that. This is an army. And I feel like a general at a pregame briefing of the Super Bowl of the ages. We better learn something. We better wake up. Listen to this now. I'm going to read it because I haven't had time to memorize it. In Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 6 to 7, the Bible says, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. 
for every one of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me and setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his own iniquity before his own face and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him for myself. They have separated themselves from God. It is not that God has separated himself from them. Just let some of this stuff ooze down into your spirit. If you're having financial adversity today, God has not separated himself from you. God didn't just decide you were so special he was gonna leave you out and go contradictory to his word for the first time in the ages and eons of history past. He just singled you out to fail with. Do you believe that? Well, if you listen to politicians and a lot of preachers, you probably believe it. Poor little old you. That's the lie the devil has sold from the Garden of Eden. Poor you, you're left out. Poor you, hath God said. Are you with me? Are you in the Garden of Eden? We're in the Garden of Eden. There's the provision of God, the plenty of God, the presence of God, the provision of God. It's all there. The power of God, the promise of God. And God's promise was, of every tree of the garden thou shalt eat, but of the tree in the midst of the garden of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the hour that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the devil came along and said, you won't die. Poor little Eve. Poor little puny livered Adam. They were left out. The devil said, you won't die. You'll be like God. Poor you, you've been left out. God's better than you. God's forsaken you. God's ignored you. God doesn't want you to have the best that God has to offer. He's left you out. That's the lie the devil wants you to believe. We've been sold a lie by a secular press that we ought to wear second-rate clothes and live in second-rate neighborhoods and eat second-rate food and get to the back of the line so that all the whoremongers and all the adulterers and all the dope addicts can get to the front of the line. I say hogwash. I say it's time we recognize the wealth of the world is laid up for us. Take it back. Second rate, second class. Somebody give me a handkerchief. There he is again. That's the original, the one and only. Mutt man right there. Let's just have a little heart to heart. Huh? Let's just, let's just lay down the preacher stuff for a while, the preacher and the pew thing. Let's lay that down for a minute. Let's just talk. You don't really believe that lie anyway. You don't believe that. You don't believe having less makes you more godly. If you did, you'd give everything you own the offering this morning. Huh? Isn't that the truth? So how much is it that God wants you to have? How how much is it? I mean, where do you cross over the line and the abundance of God being poured out on your life to where, okay, that's enough and God is upset because you have that? Where do you get to that point? Huh? Huh? We're living in a mentality, a hostile environment has been created toward every preacher that stands in a pulpit. Everyone. They shouldn't have this and they shouldn't do that. And my God, that, and, and the only thing that is is just abject jealousy. 
News agents go around flying over my house. Well, maybe we ought to take ours and go fly over their house. Nobody. I told one of them one time in this city, complaining about where I live. I said, well, if you would become successful in your chosen profession, I'm sure you wouldn't have to live in a two bedroom flat and couldn't pay your rent. If you were good at what you do, I'm sure Dan Rather don't live in a two bedroom rented flat. It's good, isn't it? I mean, it just kind of cocks your head on straight. Don't get mad at me. Some of them getting so mad at me now. Boy, I've hit, I've hit both no-nos today. I've hit politics and money all in the same day. God is not separating himself from you. God is not withholding his best from you. If there's a separation, you created it. I didn't say it, God said it. Read it in the book of Ezekiel. He did not sep- they did he did not separate himself from them. They separated themselves from him. Come on. We believe the prosperity message. We believe God wanted to touch our lives. We believe God wanted us to pay off our mortgages. We believe God wanted us to pay our bills and finance the end time harvest before the news media got a hold of us. And oh, what fountains of truth. Ezekiel 14 verse 20 says, though Noah, Daniel, and Job, how many of you believe that's a pretty heavy three hitter? Those those are not lightweights, are they? Huh? Noah, I think he had it together. Daniel, he was all right. Job had a greater revelation than anybody in the word of God of who God was, who Jesus was. But God said, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their own righteousness. They could not even spare their own children. These men knew intercession. You think Noah didn't know how to pray? You think Daniel didn't know how to pray? You think that Moses, you think that Job didn't know how to pray? But the Bible said they could but only deliver their own soul. They could not even pray their kids into it. Watch now. Jeremiah, the weeping intercessor. You couldn't have stronger prayer than the prophet Jeremiah. Listen, nothing can avail to bless that which has voluntarily of its own accord entered into a covenant with the curse. Don't look at me with that holier than thou look on your face now. Come on. I could pray for you till my tongue fell out. I could put enough oil on you, you look like a greased pig at a county fair. Benny could blow on you till you felt the north wind. Are you listening? You could go to every meeting. Brother Shambach could massage your head. We could all just call a fast and pray for the next 150 years for your finances. And it would be to no avail because you have voluntarily made a decision to enter into the curse. It's not popular, is it? People don't like to hear it, do they? They always wanna blame somebody else. It's the preacher's fault. It's the president. We blamed everybody from the preacher to the president. How can we do that when we're sitting in a land, when we're sitting in a land where an immigrant to this nation in the last 12 years, Arnold Schwarzenegger, can get paid $22 million to make a movie. But you know what he saw? He saw opportunity. 
can't even talk right. I ran into him, I ran into him in the Columbus airport. My wife and I had just been married. It was, a, it was a Sunday morning. We were getting ready to go on our honeymoon. And he and Maria Shriver had been married just a few weeks before that. And he was getting on the same airplane that we were getting on. We had just been married the day before. Well, my sister showed up at the airport. She had big signs saying, I forget what it was, happy honeymoon or something like that. Balloons and everything down there. We're trying to get on the airplane. Well, Schwarzenegger and Shriver are standing there. And Schwarzenegger says, <laughs> he saw those, he saw those signs, you know. He <laughs> said, how was the first night? I said, you remember that movie of yours, Arnold? You're getting ready to let off some steam, Leonard. <laughs> You're about to fry that guy with steam? I said, it was hot, Arnold. The first night was hot. I said, by the way, how many did you have at your wedding? He said, several hundred. I said, we had several thousand, Arnold. I'm not talking, listen. See opportunity and seize it. Some of you have been lied to. Some of you have been lied to. Black people can't ever, they can't ever achieve. Hogwash. Don't tell me that. That's the same thing they said about hillbillies. Huh? That's right. It's the same thing they said. They're dumb, illiterate. That's what they say about my people. They're dumb, illiterate hill runners. They'll never be river rats. They'll never be anything. They'll never amount to nothing. Schools, you think the inner city is the only place you get bad advice? I told my high school, I told my high school guidance counselor I wanted to be an attorney. She said, you don't have the brains for it told me that to my face. Yeah. Are you listening? Yeah. I told my professors in university, in college, that I wanted to build a great church. They said it had never happened. I know what it's like to be pushed back. I know what it's like to be denied, but I, the difference in you and me is I refuse to be refused and I deny to be denied. This is America, I serve God, I can accomplish anything I have a heart to accomplish. This is the land of opportunity. I can be somebody. I can have something. I can accomplish things. The greater one lives in me. I'm a new creature. My mind is anointed. I have a creator living in me. My God. My God. My God. My God. Get that out of your mind. Get it out of your mind. Study hard, work hard, go upstream, swim against the tide. Don't be stopped by the naysayers who say it can't be done.
listen to hopelessness perpetrators. We're serving God. He makes something out of nothing. And don't you hold your children back. My little girl came to me the other day. She said, I want, when I grow up, I want to be a preacher, a doctor, and a nurse. I said, great, three incomes. You're going to take care of daddy real good. Amen. Oh, but Brother Rod, we should be realists. Not me. I know realists. I'm a supernaturalist. I believe in something bigger than na the natural. I believe in something bigger than what I can see and bigger than what I can hear and bigger than what I can know with my mind. I believe that the greater one that flung the worlds into being resides inside my mortal body and he's not a loser and he's not a quitter and he's not a failure. He's an overcomer. Well, I'm stuck, Brother Rod. Get unstuck. Don't you, don't you squeeze yourself into the mold of the hypocrisy of this world. That's not who you are. I love every one of you, but I don't put up with that stuff. Well, I didn't have this opportunity and I didn't have that opportunity. Well, good. The only thing I see in that brat pack is another bunch with their hands stuck out waiting on somebody to do everything for them. Families that are supported, young men and women getting married in this nation have absolutely no ability to take care of themselves. Have to depend on mom and dad to take care of them. Bunch of little spoiled brats. Maybe if you start at the bottom, have to claw your way up, you'll get a little tenacity in you. You'll get a little backbone in you. You'll get a little fight in you. You'll get, hey, hey, get hungry. Get hungry, brother. Get hungry for more and better. Quit being satisfied. hearing me out of the book of Ezekiel though they were great men of God they couldn't even bring their children along because their children made the decision to enter into the curse and regardless of who they were and what they had accomplished in God they couldn't bring their children along the children had to make the choice for themselves and I'm telling you this morning you've got to make a choice for yourself some of you are 55 and quit Shame on you. Well, I've worked all my life. Well, if you have and you're done working, you might as well get off the planet. Because if you've worked all your life, that means when you stopped working, your life ended. I don't believe in that anyway. Huh? Retirement. What's that for? It's for decay. Go down to Southern Florida and look at them. Pitiful things. I don't have any 55, 60 years old walking around like they're 94. Get up in the morning, have no idea what they're gonna do that day. Boy, we're living it up now, aren't we? We're gonna go to the grocery store and pluck the watermelons. Stop that. Stop that. If you're looking at anything in retirement, you ought to look at it as a place to launch out of your secular employment and go full time for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't care if it's cutting grass or washing toilets or encouraging somebody else or visiting the elderly or going to the hospitals. I don't care or answering prayer phones. I don't care what it is, but don't you give up and don't you sit down just the time somebody learns something in this nation. We retire them and send them out to pasture. Stop that. You don't have to agree with my politics, but I'll require you to agree with my philosophy. We're not quitters. 
We're not give up. We're not give up, roll over and play dead. Forget that stuff. You ought to encourage people. Some of you that live in the inner city, you ought to be encouraging people around you. You can do better than this. We can do better than this. Let's get out here and clean up this yard. Let's start right there. Huh? People sitting on door front stoops. You can point your finger at me and say, you got a white face and don't understand me if you want to. I understand some things. Some things I don't, but some things I do. And when I drive through a neighborhood and there's 14 men that look like Arnold Schwarzenegger sitting around on a porch stoop in the middle of a filthy, dirty neighborhood that you couldn't kick your way through, that tells me something. And you can't blame anybody for your lack of pride and your lack of decency. I don't care. I don't care if all you've got's one pair of blue jeans, brother. They can be clean. I don't care if you got to stop at a roadside rest somewhere and hunt yourself a bar of soap out of a gas station and get in the middle of the thing and wash it out and hang them outside while you stay in the restroom waiting on them to dry. You can have clean clothes and you can have a shaved face and you can get up in the morning and you can pick up the dirt and filth in the middle of your house and you can clean your dishes and you can scrub your cabinets and you can turn that place into or something and somebody may drive by and say my God there's somebody that knows how to work you know what I'm talking about there's no sense in it it's a quitting giving up hopeless attitude what right do you have to be hopeless None. You don't know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about. I remember when my daddy, I remember when my daddy made $127 a week working 40 hours. I remember what it's like for him to come home, sit down, pray over the food, love his kids, kiss their cheeks get back in an old rundown car and go out somewhere to work the rest of the night and get home at one or two o'clock in the morning and start all over again the next day. But people want to point their finger at him today. Hey, look at that, look at that. Look. Yeah, look at that. I wish some of you would look at it. You realize you could do something if you'd get out of the bed in the morning, brush your teeth and comb your hair. If you'd get your nose out of the front of a television set, listening to a bunch of people that tell you you can't and you won't and you won't ever. And you just grab a hold of the day and you jerk it yourself up by your bootstraps and say in the name of God, tomorrow night, I'm going to be better off than I am today. And nobody's going to do it for you but you. Nobody. I've blown this, haven't I? Ezekiel gave them the answer. Though this mighty array of prayer warriors could not help, repentance could. Ezekiel 14, 6, repent and turn yourselves from your idols. Ezekiel 14, 6, the Knox translation, God said, come back to me. Well, I could never work a second job. How would I play in the softball league? And there's opportunity. You don't believe, you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. I drive, I drive through the drive through at McDonald's. The drive through at McDonald's. Well, I'd never work at McDonald's. Go through the drive through at McDonald's. Man, they got banners, they got things spinning on tops, they got jobs, 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 jobs. Yeah, but Brother Rod, I got three kids. I can't support them three kids on McDonald's wages. You can support them better doing that than sitting on the front porch too. Can't you? I said, can't you? I had a man in this church tell me one time, I need a job. Well, we had some things needed to be done. He was facing bankruptcy. I could see why later. He was facing bankruptcy. 
facing bankruptcy. I said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll help you out. Came to me wanting money, got mad because I wouldn't give him $2,000. Got mad because I wouldn't just hand him $2,000. I said, well, I'll tell you what you can do. Are you working? No. Well, would you work? Well, I don't know. I said, well, I'll pay you $10 an hour. I'll give you the, I'll give you the $2,000. I'll pay you $10 an hour till you can pay it back. I'll give you a job making $10 an hour. You know what he said? I don't work for less than 20. That's what he said to me. Now, how many of you know? You ain't too smart to talk like that to me. That's crazy. People don't believe me. I pastored this church with 500 people in it. I made $125 a week. See, some of you will never pastor. You ain't smart enough. You don't want to work hard enough. I heard of a man the other day, about 500 people in his church. How much, how much money did he make in 19, what, 90? How much? 175,000. <laughs> you listening to me? I don't know, you're just bored. You just wish you could just go. I'm just talking to you out of my heart. We gotta change the way we think. Find something and do it. Do it. Sitting around doing nothing. Get yourself a second job. What? A second job? And if you want to raise on work, if you want to raise at work, go in and prove to your boss why you deserve one. Well, I deserve one because I've been here five years. Yeah, and you're doing the same thing right now you were doing when you were hired five years ago, only probably less. Can you believe I talk to people like this? Well, you don't have to listen. It's all right with me. Just go ahead, blame, other, blame everybody else. But blaming everybody else don't put any more food on your table. And blaming everybody else doesn't get you out of the neighborhood you're in. And blaming everybody else doesn't climb you up any higher out of your despair. You can blame everybody you want to and still be sitting on the porch too. Just go to blaming, just sit right there and blame. Tomorrow morning you'll be sitting on the porch stoop again. I already did. I think they got it. We got to repent of entering into the curse. The devil wants you to focus on the famines in Ethiopia. Move your leg, Tony. Wants you to focus on the famines in Ethiopia and other parts of Africa where people are starving. They are starving, but not because God did not provide more than enough. The earth is producing plenty of food. It is man who is failing in his responsibility to distribute that food properly. Satan wants to keep you struggling in your finances, in bondage to need and in bondage to want. He has deceived the people in India into believing it is wrong to eat cows so every cow in India is left untouched, eating enough food to feed seven people. Since there are about 200 million sacred cows eating in India, then it would figure that if India would stop giving the food to the cows, they could feed 1 billion 400 million people with what the cows are eating. But Americans are duped into thinking, well, poor God. Poor God, he created this earth and we've had a population explosion, so what we need to do is enforce birth control through Planned Parenthood meetings in our local public school systems so that we can curb this population explosion. Don't you understand that's what's going on? Don't you know that's the agenda? Don't 
be deceived. The liberal left wants to control the population in this nation. Don't you know that? Can't you see that? No, you swallow that hook, line, and sinker. We're the ones who care about the blight of the inner cities. That's hogwash. Look at their policies. All they did is dig you deeper into despair. Look at it. You're harvesting it now. That's not the hope. Look at abortion. There are people running around in this nation. I heard Christian, so-called Christian leaders last week say they really hadn't decided yet about this abortion thing. I heard it with my own ears. It's population control. It's euthanasia. Don't you see that? They did the same thing with the Dr. Spock Renaissance revival in the 1950s. And look what we reap for that. Look at the seedbed of rebellion that produced. Come on now. Limit your families and just spend more quality time with these and don't spank them and don't. That'll be the day when in this nation I won't open my mouth when somebody says that 12-year-old that children ought to have the right to sue their parents in this nation. Sick. Sick. They want to control the population. They're doing it. They're doing it right now. I dream about this stuff. There are 10,000 cases. There are, there are millions of cases, but there are 10,000 cases right now of AIDS, according to the Center for Disease Control in this nation, for which there's no known cause. They don't know how they got it. Now people are showing up with full-blown AIDS that don't have the HIV virus. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. And then vote so that government-funded Planned Parenthood can operate with tax dollars and hand out condoms in the public school systems. Think about it. You know the reason that many of you can't put your children in this school when you give anything in your life to put them in this school because you have to pay tax dollars to support government education that has failed and everybody knows it's failed. And then the liberals want to come along and say, well, we'll give you a voucher system. Read the fine print. It's a voucher system that your kid can choose this public school or that public school, but they can't come to this school. Am I talking to anybody? It's, it's just an overall, it's a, it's, a, it's a great big smoke screen. I resist that. People don't care about you when they tell you to go ahead and live a promiscuous, a promiscuous lifestyle and use abortion as birth control. They don't love you. They don't care about you. They don't care about the soul of this nation. They believe in legalized murder. Who will it be next? Those that don't look like them? handicapped, the disadvantaged, the less fortunate, the aged, who's next? Who will we decide next doesn't have a right to live? You better be careful because it might be somebody in your group. I can't help it. I'm not talking politically. I'm talking morally. Please understand me. Vote for whoever you want to. I'm talking about moral issues. I'm talking about repairing the breach. 
I'm not only talking about getting America back to work. I'm talking about America deciding to go back to work. I'm tired of being told that other nations are greater than this nation. I'm tired of that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I've been there. We have the, liest, large, the highest standard of living of any nation on this planet right now in America. And we want to return to socialism when the government can't get mail from Columbus, Ohio to Washington, D.C. without losing two-thirds of it. We want them to take over our health care. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, let's let the government do that. Well, health care costs are skyrocketing. Well, quit suing everybody in 40 counties. This nation is so crazy. There are three against me right now. And all I'm trying to do is help people. Doctors are afraid to doctor. Nurses are afraid to nurse. Lawyers are afraid to lawyer. We can't get people to sign up to coach Little League Baseball because they're afraid that some parent's gonna come along and sue them. Stop it. If you got a problem with somebody, go talk to them. How about that? And let these words be forever sealed from your lips. You'll hear from my attorney. What ever, ever happened to an America that talked to one another? Pastors are afraid to pastor. Oh, you need some crazy woman to come along and say anything in the world. Or man. I just happen to be a man. We gotta have policies in this church upon policies, stacked upon policies. If I'd bring them in here, they'd reach from the floor to the ceiling to try to protect ourselves from you. People come in here and they get saved and get filled with the Holy Ghost and their families get turned around and they fall in love with God and people that wouldn't have known Jesus if they met him in the middle of the street get on their way to heaven. And somebody turns around, they didn't like something, they sue you. And then the liberal news media, they jump on that hook, line, and sinker. Look at what happened to me. I didn't do a thing. It was proven that I didn't do one thing. It was proven that there was absolutely no evidence that I'd done one thing. And there's a thousand people that used to be in this church that aren't here anymore. Because during the seven months that the liberal press got to eat my lunch before the judicial system caught up with it and said, oops, the prosecutor said to the judge, we don't have anything to charge this man with. There's no evidence that he should have ever even been charged in the first place, much less brought to trial. But that doesn't matter. We're living on a razor's edge. Some lady comes along, whoever she may be, and says, one of our preachers said thus and to to her in a, in a, in a counseling session, files a lawsuit. Are you in this building? Something's wrong in America. You got a problem with me. You got a problem with one of my preachers. You got a problem with some of my staff. By God, come and talk to us. You sat in these pews for years. Boy, we just need a good old fashioned talk, don't we? You gotta have insurance for this and insurance for that and insurance for that to protect yourself from the people that you dug out of the depths of hell because they've been duped with this American philosophy that everybody's out to get you. Of 
course, we didn't have lawsuits like that when we had 50 people. Because we had 50 people, nobody perceived we had any money. They're not smart enough to know we had more than we got now. Everything's relative. When you got 50 people, your, your light bill's $100 a month. When you got 5,000 people, your light bill's 15,000 a month. Everything's relative. You got any more now than you got then. You're using it to preach the gospel. But see, they perceive that. They perceive you have money and they're out to get it. They're going to get it, they think. Well, they can file all the lawsuits they want. They can say anything they want. Luann Stoyer can get on Channel 10, say anything she wants. I don't care. I have made up my mind. I don't care. You understand? I don't care. You might as well just get tough about it. And it's in, it's in our faith, it's in the church, it's in government, it's in our, it's in our school systems, it's in, it's in our social system. It's everywhere. People are scared of you. We're afraid of each other. We're afraid to love each other because we're afraid of each other. I'm almost afraid to shake hands with people anymore. Somebody say I rubbed their hand the wrong way. Sounds funny, but it's not funny. Isn't it a shame that a man of God has to think about the way he lays hands on people? So somebody doesn't accuse him of something and go file a lawsuit? Sick. Everybody just say it's sick. It's sad. Next time somebody wants to talk to you about government, government run health care, go try to buy a $2 roll of stamps at the post office. By the time you spent two hours in line, you'll be willing to not let the government have anything to do with it. It takes away all the incentive. I've been to hospitals in nations with government-run health care. I've been there. Ours is in bad shape. But it's a pretty good duck for the shape it's in. Oh, God. I love this nation. I love you. But I'm concerned this morning. I'm concerned about all the lies being perpetrated on us. We just get lied to and lied to and lied to and lied to. I'm tired of all the hypocrisy and all the lies and all the deceit. Aren't you? Let's just get back to a simpler life. Let's Let's get back to where people had pride in their neighborhoods and where people didn't think the worst of everybody else and where people didn't think everybody else was out to get them and where people didn't see the lifeline to a fortune as a lawsuit and it got back to being hard work. I'm going to read some more now. It's about time to go home. Some of you will be relieved. Satan wants to keep you struggling in your finances, in bondage to want. God created more than enough. I honestly believe the devil has convinced most Christians that they live in a world of scarce resources and tells them they should feel fortunate to live in America where we have more than most. We do have more than most, but let me tell you that today... There is more than enough for all in every nation of the world. But the devil wants to keep you in a poverty mentality. Why? Because he knows the church of God cannot continue to grow through television, through global satellite networks, through multi-language literature, through millions upon millions of debt-free churches and church members without a breed of saints who will believe God to give them more than enough. 
So the devil has stolen the plank of financial freedom from the holy bridge. Let me ask you this question. If Christians do not finance the end time evangelistic outreach promised in the word of God, who will? The pornographers make millions of dollars in profits by selling smut to America, but no pornographer will ever give one penny to finance the gospel. No smut movie producer will ever give one dime to finance the next major evangelistic crusade in Europe. The gospel takes money, but the wealth of the wicked will never finance one penny of any outreach of ministry and evangelistic campaigns or churches. All that need money to build buildings, to provide the heat, to teach the principles of the kingdom of God to every creature. And God is raising up a crop of end time bankers to make every one of these outreaches possible. It is time to nail back the plank of financial freedom onto our bridge of God's end time prosperity. If you do not need anything, if all your family members are saved, if everyone in your house is full of the Holy Ghost so that people are slain in the spirit when they walk through your front door, if you have more money than you can spend, if your body is not in any form of pain, infirmity, malady, or malfunction, if you have no trouble with your teenagers, then just go on to the next plank in this book. This chapter is not for anyone like that. Anyone like that should not be on this planet. This chapter is for all of you who are currently wallowing in in a sense of spiritual poverty, a poverty that affects your health, a poverty that affects your wealth. Our God is a way maker, a blind man healer, a leper cleanser, an abundant provider. He is a healing, delivering, providing, miracle working Jesus. Yet Satan would have you believe there is no financial freedom in the gospel. Look how backwards the world has become in the area of finances. When you borrow from your own account on plastic, and pay 18% interest a year on that money, the world has convinced you that you have credit. When you take your money and use it for what you need and they charge you 18% above the cost of the thing you bought, they tell you that's credit. Is anybody listening to me? Don't worry about it, I'll let you out at noon. I know you got to get to that second job. <laughs> Wake up. You don't have credit. You got debit. Why don't you call that a debit card? We, we call the most insidious plague ever hit the North American continent AIDS. I never found anybody helped out by it, have you? I didn't say that to be funny. I'm telling you the way that the nations lie to you. They do it even subconsciously, calling the most insidious disease in the North American continent AIDS. Calling 18% credit on using your own money out of your own account credit. It's debit. You owe the money and you borrowed it at a higher rate than we have ever seen in modern history. But you would not be as quick to use your charge card if you called it a debit card. That is too negative a connotation. So the devil has lured the body of Christ into a think positive term when they use, quote, credit cards. As a result of easy credit, Christians are in deep debt at an astounding rate, and the devil rejoices. For how can you finance the gospel when you are busy financing the banks of America? Friend, you do not need credit cards. You need the son of the living God. You need to know how to get in touch with him and how to get him to move on your behalf in every area of your life, including your finances. Are you tired of playing church? Aren't you tired of going to church and going home praying to God that you really don't know, never seeing him move, never seeing the manifestation of his glory in your finances? Aren't you tired of never feeling the overwhelming power of his presence come upon you like a garment? Aren't you tired of praying for your finances month after month and still finding yourself deeper and deeper in debt 
Well, I've got news for you. If you need something today that you did not have yesterday, then you need to learn to do something different today than the way you were doing it yesterday. It is time to throw away the traditional religious ideas of how we pray and how God wants us to flounder in poverty in a poverty mentality. The traditional religious ideas are not getting the job done. Friend, the church is still sick broke and the world is going to hell it is time to change something it's all in the book it's all in the book it's a life changing book I mean it you ought to read it and read it and reread it and reread it and reread it you ought to get it in your spirit my God, once and for all, get that poverty mentality out of your spirit. I'm not talking about just producing wealth so you can use it on your own lust. You're smarter than that. You're more mature than that. But the gospel needs preached. You know the hope for our inner cities? It's not the Republicans or the Democrats. It's you and me. It's churches outstanding preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, telling men that don't have any jobs they can have dignity training up their children, giving them pride and decency and hope. That's the church's job. But we haven't done it. And we can't do it poor. We can't do it just paying our own bills. We can't do it. We've got to get you free. I said, we've got to get you free. And you believe the lie that is perpetrated on this generation and you'll never be free. God's got more than enough. Don't you be ashamed to act your faith upon it. Go out and get it and use it for the kingdom of God. Don't ever be afraid to believe God to give you a second job so you can put your children in Christian education. Don't think that way. Look for ideas. Ask God to let his creative ability flow in you. And God will change your life. Well, since everybody's so sleepy, might as well go home and start over again tonight. I appreciate you letting me have this little talk with you. I just kind of stood all of it. I could stand. hope for America it's not in the Houston convention and it's not in the New York City convention it's right here in this room the potential that's in this room the hope that's in this room the wealth that's in this room you know what the world is laying up all the wealth and they don't even have the power to get it. You and I have the God-given power to get wealth. Deuteronomy 8.18. We have the power to go out and get wealth. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I said hallelujah. How many of you want to be free? Well, I'm going to say this. You can't bless what God's cursed. You enter into the curse when you withhold 10% of your sanctified gross income from the work of God. You enter into the curse and it doesn't matter who prays for you and who's elected president and who's the governor. It didn't matter if Noah prayed and Jeremiah prayed and Job prayed. If you choose to enter into the curse, the curse you've entered into. But right on the other hand, if you choose to enter into the blessing, you can't be stopped. I said you can't be stopped. You can't be stopped. But God will not bless idolatry. God won't bless you using 90% of your income plus to finance your own lusts and your own lifestyle while his kingdom goes unattended to. God calls it idolatry. It's the same reason the Soviet Union fell. He cut off the rain because of the idolatry. For nine years, the Soviet Union never had a, a profit crop for nine straight years. Are you listening to me? People are starving. But they chose to enter into a curse. They chose to ban the name of God. 
to deny the gospel access. We're going to go ahead and receive the offering. I wish I'd done it before I started talking. I don't want you to think I talked all this time about an offering. That's not true. And those of you that know this ministry know that. But today you have the opportunity to enter into the blessing or enter into the curse. To enter into the blessing, 10% of your income goes to the work of God. Right off the top, the first fruits. If you're making out a check, make it payable to World Harvest Church or put a WHC on it. If you need an offering envelope for your cash giving, they are in the pew in front of you. The pink envelopes are for your giving to the End Time Joseph Feed the Hungry program to bless the starving children of God around the world whose governments decided to enter into the curse, but they never did. And so we have the relief program to feed them, to touch their lives, to be the supply of their prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. We supply that bread through those pink envelopes. But I want you to think just a moment. I know this hasn't been the most eloquent message you've ever heard. It's not a camp meeting swing from the chandelier's message. It's just a time that I could open up my heart and talk to you. And I want to say don't ever let anybody tell you you can't. Don't listen to those people. The truth's not in them. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We can make a difference. You can start today. You can start climbing out of debt today. Read the book, it'll tell you how. Father, bless this offering. Bless everyone that's obedient to your word. Bless the finances of this great local church and the finances of every person who agrees with its mission and sows into it their life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Network leaders full of the Holy Ghost. Run and run in.
Praise the Lord. I want to remind you of the World Harvest Church Golf Classic and Family Outing, Valley View Country Club in Lancaster, Ohio, Golf Classic Dinner September 4th, and the Classic September the 5th. The golf tournament is September the 5th. The family outing starts at noon, and uh, they've got everything in the world going on at this thing. I never saw. It's going to be greater than the Ohio State Fair, I'm telling you. They've got, I mean, they've got more activities for your family and fellowship than you could ever imagine. You can pick up a flyer about it, and uh, we want you to come and be a part of it. It's a week from this coming Saturday. Is that right? Week from this coming Saturday. You World Harvest Bible Institute students, enrollment two weeks away from the first day. Enrollment is already at 425 students from 33 states and six nations. I wouldn't sit here in Columbus and let it pass me by. Get yourself an application. Get signed up. If you're going to Israel with me in November, get signed up. We're ready to go. We're going to have a great time in the land of the Bible. Tonight, Lord willing, I'm going to be preaching and ministering on uh, the power of the Holy Ghost. God willing. God willing. I had something else planned for this morning, too. Uh, I want to say this before we go home today. Just like if I could come down there and just talk to every one of you. I want you to know I love you. That I care about you. And that I believe in you. And I've said some things today that if you want to, you can get mad about. If you want to. I mean, you take, a, take, a, take a time like that. If, if, the, if I haven't offended everybody, it wasn't because I didn't try to. In reality, I didn't desire to offend anybody. And I hurt for this nation. I hurt for it. I hurt for it on both sides of the political issues. And I, I mainly hurt for it because the emphasis of the church is fell so little in our society. I don't know. I just want you to know I love you. I don't tell you that much. I love you. And that you show up in these pews it's overwhelming to me and it's my heart's prayer that some way I can pastor you the way that you deserve to be pastored I want you to love somebody on your way out today these folks are here because if you're unsure of your eternal destiny you're not sure you're ready to go to heaven hell is a reality if you're sick in your body you have pain in your body you have trouble in your marriage you're having problems in your finances whatever you need is available to you from the throne of God and these folks are ready to put you in contact with the throne of God. They're ready to meet you at the point of your need. Everybody turn to somebody next to you and say, God is great. God is great. And greatly to be praised. We'll see you tonight at 7 o'clock. Until then, you remember these words. He is holy. He is holy. He is worthy. Oh, oh, glory. Ushers, if you'd get those books to the doors, people are already driving us crazy down here. They want to get them to the doors. If you're leaving today, the books sell in the bookstores for $11.95, $10.95, something like that. Just put a $10 bill in their hand as they go out the door today. I guarantee you, you'll not be disappointed. And the ushers will have them at the doors. God bless you. We'll see you tonight. He is holy.